And I always love talking about mental health because that's, that's the field that I work in. And I love talking, uh, uh, combining healing and health with the word of God. That's my favorite thing to do. So let's pray before I go into what we're talking about today. Father Glory, thank you so much that you know everything. And even if it's not okay with me, it's okay because you know. If it's not okay with us here today and if the, the content is going to be a little bit too much for some, I know that it's okay because you're here and you can dispatch angels to be with us and to comfort us. We thank you for your presence, Almighty oh God. And I just ask that you speak through me and that words may be comfort and hope to those who need it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So today we're talking about resilience and how to build resilience through tough times. And I don't know if there's anybody that can say the last year hasn't been tough, challenging in some way. We've, ne we've all been impacted by the events uh, since, start, since it started last March up until now, when we don't know really when it's going to end. If you're a family with children, you have to answer endless questions about when and how. And if you're the elderly as they class in this country, then you have to stay in all the time. And, you know, you, some people have lost their jobs and some people are still furloughed and university students are doing classes in their in their bedroom and extroverts are struggling and introverts are happy we're not we're we've all been impacted by this by the events of this year and some of us have experienced more losses than others and so we need to talk about resilience and what is it and what it's not so and i believe that as we as we near the close of this history the enemy is advancing in a static and he will leave no stone unturned to put us in position that makes us feel like we're not a, that, like we're alone and it's not okay. So we have to be wise to his devices and know what to do to protect ourselves as people of God. So I'd like to share with you about resilience, uh, the kind that will bend but not break because it's okay to not okay. And I, I think I'm going to refer to this song a lot today because it's just so appropriate. So I work with people who experience trauma and, and the word on the street is no one thing heals. No one thing can heal us. I was listening to the tra a training on the impact of trauma on, on the brain and how the body keeps the memories of the events that occur. And then the trainer said, no one thing heals. And when he said that, I couldn't help thinking about God. I couldn't help thinking my mind just went there. And he, because God, he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. He promised to heal all of our wounds and restore health unto us because he is God. Now, how do we, how does he keep his promises? They're all through scriptures. Like, let's, let's use the big event. The biggest event the world has ever seen, in my opinion, is Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Daniel spoke about it in Daniel 9, 25 to 27. Malachi prophesied about, prophesied about it in chapter 4 of Malachi. And Isaiah said, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It, the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus' is coming, and David talked about it in uh, Psalms chapter 22. And history confirms it. I believe he may have something to say about our mental health, how we heal, and the crisis and the things that we go through. So I'm going to start sharing my screen as we talk about what resilience is and some of the things that he has provided to take care of us as we go through tough times. And how we use them, because we have to use them in order for them to work. We have to use this, this, this strategies that he gives us in order for them to work. So what is resilience? What is resilience? Before I de define, I, I give a definition of resilience, which one of these people put a one in the chat or, or just tell me, is it one for male, two for female? Which one do you think demonst is demonstrating resilience? Which one? One or two? They know, they know it's not a trick question. So you can you can vote. It's not a trick question. Which one is demonstrating resilience? Both. 
Anybody else? Which one? One and two. Right. You, oh, I like this chart. So they're both demonstrating resilience, right? Because, well, I'm going to go into why in a moment, but I'm going to read what resilience is. Resilience is the ability to successfully cope with a crisis and to return to pre-crisis state status quickly. And there's another definition of resilience that I like. It says resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It's the capacity. And it's the capacity part that really interests me. And that's where we need to apply Isaiah 50, 53 and the whole word of God and, and help the health message and all of it. We apply and then we become, we have the capacity. I think of a capacity as, if you know those bands, um, elastic bands that you can pull and they stretch or those ones that you you know people put on now when they're exercising that has capacity because it can it can stretch that's that's what resilience is we have the capacity but how do we develop the capacity and how do we get to pre-crisis status quickly now i think sometimes the emphasis is on the quickly and because the emphasis is on the quickly people kind of try to stop down the pain, try to pretend that it's not happening because the, the idea is I want to get back to that place quickly. And I want everybody to think that I'm okay, that I'm coping and that I'm fine because I can get back to this place quickly. And we miss out on the, pa the part about the ability to successfully cope and that we have to have capacity in order to get back to the place quickly. And if we were using, when we experience crisis, and when we experience trauma, and when we experience um, all of the chaos that life has to offer, if we knew how to use the word of God in the way that he intends for us to use and to lean on him, then we would be able to do it successfully quickly. But we don't, but we want to get back quickly. And the body just, and all the pain just locks in the body. And then we start, we turn up with all kind of physical illnesses. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So when re resilience exists, when persons uses mental processes and behaviors in promoting personal asset and protecting self from the potential negative effects of stresses. So that's a whole thing there that, that needs to be happening in order for us to be resilient. And it exists in people who develop psychological and behavioral capabilities that allow them to remain calm during crisis and chaos. So there are two things that you need to develop. We need to have the psychological part and the behavior that goes with it too. Oftentimes resilience, and I know sometimes in religious settings, is talk of as just, you just need to think right. You just need to fix your negative thoughts. You just need to memorize more scriptures. You just need to do all of this cognitive processes and you're going to be okay. You need, you're going to be resilient. The thing with the brain is, the brain and the body is connected. When one hurts, the other sympathizes. And so when anything happens, whatever it is that happens, the both are working together. So the brain takes a hit, it connects to the nervous system, which, which is connected to our organs and our digestive system. And so the whole body is in pain. The whole body needs attention. So the behavioral part is really so important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the behaviors that we can develop in order to help us to cope with crisis so that we can get back to pre-crisis state quickly. So it, resilience is also the ability to move from the incident without long-term negative consequences. Now that takes time. And oftentimes we don't have time or we don't want to put the time in that is going to take to, do, to get us back to that place where we don't have negative long-term consequences. And because we don't want to put the time in, when we don't put the time in, that's when we have long-term negative consequences. When somebody comes to me for therapy, sometimes they ask, how long is it going to take? And I always laugh because it reminds me when we're going on a journey. You know, when you travel with children and they said, how long? Are we there yet? It's kind of like that. Um, depending on the event that, and, and all other complex factors that might be involved, that determines how long it takes. It's kind of like if you have, say, diabetes and you're, tr you're having treatment, how long does it take to heal? How long does it take to get back to your, your healthy self where you don't, have to, you don't have to be dependent on 
you know, taking your blood sugar level every day? What, what are the things that you will need to do in order to get back to pre-diabetic state? Kind of like that. Or if you have cancer, say, and you're getting treatment, how long will it take to get back to, you know, to get in the all clear and to stay all clear? And it's the same thing with emotional pain, with emotional things, with mental health, with crises that we go through. It's not a quick fix. There's no quick fix. But there are things that you can do that will help to get you back to pre-crisis state without long-term negative consequences. And the clue is in the capacity part. The clue is in the successfully cope when we were talking about what is resilience. Sometimes we mask and we wear masks and hide in the open, I call it, using things like God is good, he's doing great things, but secretly and in private and in the recesses of our heart, we struggle to believe because the pain challenges our perception of God and it skewed our image of him. Because when we're in pain, our frontal lobe is not online. It's not working as it should when we're triggered and we're in pain. It's not working as it should. And so it's, you know, it's easier for us then to plunge in despair and doubt and to allow fear to come in. Because our frontal lobe, where we do our reason and our thinking, where we make good decisions, when we are in pain, that is offline. It's not working as it should. And that's where we can apply the word of God. That's where we successfully cope. That's where we develop capacity. And that's why the Bible says we must be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion and he's going about seeking whom he may devour. We are sober and vigilant. We stay sober and vigilant in our frontal lobe. Now, it is said that uh, trauma, or rather when we remember, the whole frontal lobe is shut down. Our speech goes, it's kind of like we're locked in a dark tunnel, you know? Um, to, today, we're using techniques mostly rooted in, they use all kinds of techniques to, to help people, to, to treat people from trauma. But what is the one thing that can help you to stay grounded, even among the storm of memories and and the sharpness of the pain. For those who are praying and fasting and reading the Bible and studying, yet the brokenness exists and the pain exists. Stay with us today because God has brought you here for a reason. He's brought you here so that you can learn how to, how to cope and not allow, um, and, I, and I won't say allow, but know what to do when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel overloaded, when it feels like nothing is working and when it feels like you're going to be, you're drowning under the sea of your particular challenge that you're, you're experiencing. Now, I, I'm touching on uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences and incidents in childhood that affect health across a generation because sometimes this is the root of why we can't cope. Sometimes this is the root of most of, 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 our, of our issues and our problems. Now, this, this is, when we experience uh, trauma in our childhood, when we experience adverse childhood experiences, we have, we're pro more prone to heart disease. We're twice more likely to have depression. There is autoimmune illnesses. When crisis happens, a crisis, for example, like the pandemic that we've been, we've been in, when that happens, it gives us, it, it, it destabilizes us quicker because there are other underlying factors. And that's, I always said there are few people in the pandemic. There's a person who can cope because they were successfully doing things throughout and they have good coping strategies. They're the people who struggled because they didn't have coping strategies and business was being used as a way of coping. And so the, the pandemic happened and we're facing lots of crisis. There's lots of losses that we've experienced through this time. And certain, some people will struggle to cope. Be, and, and your resilience will be tested, especially if you didn't have enough coping strategies to begin with. If you had no coping strategies, your, your resilience will be tested even more, right? So we're twice more likely to have depression, more prone to heart disease and autoimmune illnesses. We're, we're three, time, uh, three times more likely rather to suffer depression. And we have a 20 years lower life expectancy than everybody else. So that is something on top of everything else that is happening, right? We go through things like 
you know, a range of emotions that we're struggling with all the time. So I'm going to get, I, I like to kind of get through that and get to the coping mechanism. I want you to focus not on the events, but on the coping mechanism. When we practice ways of coping regularly, the brain gets used to it. The body gets used to it. And so it just knows what to do. Like we have to have a range of tools to deal with things. When I talk to my children, my 11 year old will say, mom, I'm bored, he'll say. And um, he, he thinks it's just one thing he can do if he's bored, it's can I watch something? And so I, I sat with him one day and explore a range of things that he can do to cope with boredom. You know, like we found about 10 things to do to cope with boredom. And I said, any one day, if you're bored, you can do this, 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 or this. And that's what resilience is. Resilience is not ignoring the problem. Resilience is knowing that there's a problem and having strategies to cope. Resilience is knowing which one of my strategies can I call on today? What are the things that I need to do today in order to cope with what's happening? Yeah, so we can cope through things in the environment that I'm gonna go through, their habits. Um, we learn how to cope as well by watching how our caregivers cope with adversity. Let me just talk a little bit about how our caregivers cope with adversity. When I was growing up, my mother was never tired. I never saw her stop and rest. She was always working. She's an amazing mom. So I got married and I have children and I'm tired. And I'm like, but immediately the thought is, but you're not supposed to. Mommy was never tired, you know. So then I, I talked to mommy and I said, well, how did you do it? Of course she was tired. She was tired. So now that she's at the age that she's at, her body is having to deal with going through so many years of working and coping and not resting long enough. And so when, you know, my mom is in her 70s and she could have been okay, more okay, but her body is catching up with itself. So we learn to cope based on how we see others coping, based on how we see the people that are around us coping. We learn how to cope that way. So sometimes building resilience is unlearning some of the things that we've learned. I had to learn how to rest. I had to learn how to stop and be okay with stopping. I had to learn that resting is actually doing something. You know, people say to me, you know, I didn't do anything today and I feel so bad. Doing nothing is doing a lot. If you're stressed, if you're pressured, if you're dealing with a crisis, if you're dealing with a loss, doing nothing, the body will need it because it needs restoring. Because if you know about New Start, you know, they, they are a health message. A part of New Start is rest. And God gives us rest so that our bodies and our minds can heal. So if we lean into just that one, it, it, you know, we will be building resilience. But sometimes we have to unlearn. Sometimes we have to close our eyes and ears from what's happening around us. Because sometimes the environment tells us that we have to cope one way. There's one way. There's only this way to manage. And when we don't follow that prescribed way, then we are seen as not spiritual enough, not okay. For example, crying is an amazing way to cope. It releases stress hormones and it calms the body. But if somebody cries at church, they might be looked on as not coping. And if you've experienced a loss, it's a natural response to losses. Crying and tears, it's a natural response to adversity and, and, and crisis. You know, being overwhelmed and know how to release that emotion, it's a natural response to it. So but the only one sometimes that we know is to shut down and to pretend that nothing's happening. And that's not resilient. That's, that's unhealthy coping strategies. When we shut down and when we pretend, and when we say, it's okay, I'm fine, and we're not fine, that's not okay. So the next one, I'm gonna, culture, before I move on, culture, how we do things, not just culture in terms of where we come from, 
the culture where I come from, I'm from Jamaica, we don't talk about pain, we don't talk about trauma. When we have a, a, a loss, for example, like a bereavement, we cry a couple of days, we cry at the funeral, we cry. But after that, especially um, not only culture in terms of the, 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 the country, but Christian circles, you're expected to move on. And if you're crying six months after, they're going, but God is good. Maybe you need to come to prayer meeting more often. Maybe you need to do this more. Or maybe you need to do this more. Crying is a natural, normal response to pain and loss. Okay? And sometimes we have to unlearn the norms in our families. Those are the places where we learn how to cope or not cope. And those are the places where we develop habits that are not serving us and they're not resilient. Okay? Resilience is the ability to cope successfully. It's the capacity. And it's in that place that we need to develop the resilience, the capacity. But I talk about crying in church and I talk about um, just allowing yourself to, to release. But that comes with a level of courage because it's vulnerable. It means that I'm exposing myself so others are seeing that I'm not okay. And vulnerability is one of the ways that we can develop resilience. But it takes courage to be vulnerable. And sometimes the environment that we're in, doesn't it doesn't um, foster vulnerability, doesn't encourage it because everybody needs to be fine. So vulnerability and openness, openness sometimes when we pray, but not really. We read, but we don't believe it applies to us. And so we hide and we are suppressing the real impact of the loss. So for example, our, Bible, our scripture read, our focus scripture today, is one of my absolute favorite verses in the entire Bible. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him and by his stripes I am healed. Oh yes. I remember talking to someone. I remember talking to someone and I was sharing with them and they were telling me the most horrific story. And I, and I listened to it and there was no emotion, no emotion at all. And I said to them, do you know, I pointed them to the scripture and immediately they became animated. They were talking, they were moving and they were telling me this theological meaning of the verse. And I said, how come when you were telling me the story, you weren't showing any emotion, but now that you're telling me the theological implications of this verse, telling me that it doesn't apply to emotional healing, you're so animated and you're so alive. And they said, because I don't believe it applies to me. And therein lies part of our problem as a, as, a faith, as a faith community. And we will, that's some of the reasons we suppress pain. That's some of the reasons why resilience can't be built in an open space where people are, are free to be vulnerable. Because often we don't believe those words apply to us. We read them, but the pain bars them from having the real impact that they should have. Because today, if I'm experiencing pain and loss today, and I know surely Jesus has borne those griefs and carried those sorrows, they cannot, I can just allow myself to feel what I'm feeling today because I know he's feeling it with me. If I really believe that he has borne it, I believe that he's feeling it with me. So I don't have to pretend that I'm not feeling anything. I can allow myself to feel the full range of emotion. I can allow myself to cry. I can be angry today. I can tell him how I feel. I can express myself. I can release the pain because I know surely he has borne my grief and carried my sorrows. And I can say to God, can you feel that? Can you feel it? It really hurts. It really hurts. I'm really sad today. This is what it feels like today. My sadness today is in my chest and I feel like I can't breathe. Today, God, my sadness is in my head and, I, and it feels like it's going to explode. My brain is not working. It's foggy. Because I believe that surely he has borne my grief and carried my sorrows. So I don't have to pretend with him. I can be vulnerable. You know, they said, we give relationships as much truth as we think it can handle. And sometimes because we, 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 get, we do that, 
We hide parts of ourselves from people. We hide parts of ourselves even from God. We don't want to show him the broken part because we can't take the broken parts to church sometimes. We can't take our broken parts to our friendship groups. We can't take our broken parts to work. We feel we can't take our broken parts to God. And so, you know, this beautiful promise that is available to us, we don't get to use it to its full capacity so that we can build resilience. And I'm inviting you today, if you take nothing else away, I'm inviting you to lean heavily on this verse, pray through it, use your concordance to find out what the words mean. What do you mean that by your stripes I am healed? Then you have to go back to Calvary. You have to go back to the cross. You have to go back to that hill where he was nailed on the cross, where he was beaten, where they put a crown of thorns on his head and he bled. By those stripes, this pain is healed. And so you're learning then how to develop and to have a relationship with him where you can tell him about how it feels honestly. And you're open to listening to what he says to do and you're willing to do it because by his stripes, you're healed. It doesn't mean that you'll never need anybody. It doesn't mean that you'll never have to talk about it. It means that you're open to doing exactly what God says to do so that you can heal. You know, when I do retreats, when I do retreats and I pray about the retreats before, before I do them, I pray about the retreats before anybody sign up. And I'm always like, God, tell me what to use so that the people who are coming will get exactly what they need. And he has never disappointed, ever. And sometimes I am blown away by the content and how well it fits with the people who I don't even know but they come to the retreat, but I don't need to know them. God knows them and he knows me, gives me the content, send them to the retreat. We have four days together in our residential setting and God put that content to work to change their lives. When we are open and when we can allow ourselves even to be vulnerable with God, he, he will do this amazing work in our lives. So I'm inviting you to spend time with that verse. Journal about every line. How do you feel about it? Do you feel it applies to you? God, I really don't feel it applies to me because I've been carrying this wound for so many years and I don't know if you can heal it because I've prayed about it. I've fasted about it and it's still here. I prayed about them not dying, but they had, they're gone. I prayed about not losing my job, getting that job. I've prayed about my depression and anxiety for years. And it's still here. I'm inviting you to not give up, to lean into his word, you know, and allow him to, to direct you what to do next. Remember, sometimes we have to unlearn. Do you have anything to unlearn so that the word of God can really take effect and so that he can share with you, he can tell you what you need to do? What resilience is not is sometimes our pain becomes our fight and we become this person that is hard because we've had to survive. We develop ways of coping that is dysfunctional and serve with, and, and um, so we develop codependency, compulsive behaviors that is easier to mask. We become busy in church. We do multiple things. We're serving in ministries. And we're doing so many things. We're juggling all the balls at once because we want to prove to the world around us and sometimes to ourselves that we're coping. But we know really we are not. Sometimes we buy into the stereotype of having everything. We can have it all and nothing suffers. The only thing is sometimes something does. Something always does. See, when we teach this message, we never teach the trade-off. When we teach the message of you can do it, don't. And sometimes this message is it's in the subtext in the room. It's in the subliminal messages. We don't say it outright, but we don't give room to talk. We give people a scripture that shut them down and we don't listen. Because vulnerability is built in community. And we don't listen to people long enough. We don't give them room to talk and to share and to be open. And when I speak at churches, 
I always invite that your church be that one church where people are okay to talk about their pain, where it's not shut down, where this one day of building resilience won't be an isolated day, where they can build it in community with you, where you're open to listening, where you won't judge them as not having a, a deep enough relationship with God, because if they did, they wouldn't be in pain. Sometimes when we're going after everything, we're masking things with busyness. And that's why I said the pandemic has affected everybody because we're not busy. Nobody was busy in the pandemic. We weren't going anywhere. And so we couldn't hide behind busy anymore. Becoming resilient means that you could choose busy, but you make deliberate steps to avoid it because you're leaning into something else. Come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You can't be busy and it's coming unto me. All you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're going to acknowledge that you've been covering. You're going to choose to process. And this is where the community comes in. Everybody needs to process. It means talking about it, externalizing it, having a safe space to cry about it. That's the process of healing. And we need support to walk the journey. The good news is God is always present. He always shows up. Janet is a busy worker. She loves the Lord and she wants to serve him. Janet wasn't born an Adventist, but embraced it when she learned about the Sabbath. Years down the line, Janet joined a group of friends and that's when the abuse began. They used the Bible to justify their actions and this was confusing for her. Surely. So much of their actions were wrong, but they were more spiritual. They had more spiritual authority. So she went along with the religious abuse and emotional abuse for over 10 years. Nine of those years, she stopped talking to God. She was busy in church, though. She was superintendent at one stage, but she couldn't pray. She couldn't speak to him. And this carried on for a long time. It affected her self-esteem, her confidence, and her sense of worth. And they took her trust in God as well. It took another 10 years and lots of work with two different therapists to restore her faith. It was a purposeful journey in search of self, God, and the meaning of life. She got back her confidence and her trust and her dependence on God was restored. Janet used the community approach to healing and building resilience. In the community approach, if the trauma happened in early life where, you know, there was where parental involvement played a role, healing and building resilience will work faster and better in community. Sometimes in a therapeutic relationship where reparenting is taking place, but also in a community. You know, research shows that people recover better and build resilience when there's community because we find shared meaning in community. We have shared where we can share, shared where we can share our pain. And where both pain and joy can coexist, we help, it helps us to build resilience in that community. Can pain and joy coexist in person? Can, do you have space for both? Sometimes this can come through talking with those who have experienced it, either or, or reading stories, hearing their testimonies, or joining a group where we can create that shared space where we can un offload. This approach works best when vulnerability is embraced and shame is no longer dominant. Shame is a big part of why we can't share, big part of why we develop unhealthy coping strategies, because I'm ashamed. Nobody else is talking about this, so I shouldn't have this issue too. When I, uh, last year, January, I got burned badly. It was traumatic to not only me, but to my family too. When I was in hospital, I got lots of text messages about how grateful I was going to be and the testimony I was going to have. I was not grateful in hospital. I was in pain, excruciating pain. I couldn't walk. Any, any movement was pain shoots everywhere. I was not in gratitude. Later on, gratitude started to come in because I started to look around and I thought, okay, my children are safe, thank God, they're fine physically, they weren't fine emotionally. We had to provide a space for them to process, for the family to process together, to heal together, because the whole family experienced the trauma, so the whole family needed to heal. 
that's what the family of God can provide, that environment where everybody can talk, who want to cry, cry, who is still angry, be angry, who is still feel guilt and fear and whatever it is, can have that safe space to do it. But sometimes we struggle. We struggle with building communities like that. And we really need it, friends. We really need the community in order for people to heal. We really need the community so that the word of God can come alive for people. For example, let's look at Isaiah 41. Rather, Isaiah 40, verse 11. Let's look at Isaiah 40, verse 11. That says, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. And he will gently gently lead those who are with young. I love the Lord and I love his word because I believe he gives us so much guidance in how we live with ourselves, with him, and how we can live in community. Now, there are many people who won't be able to relate to the God who will carry them on his bosom because they've never experienced love and care and tenderness. But I tell you what, you can demonstrate that to them by being loving and caring and tender. And if you don't know it, you can learn it. There are many books that teach us how to be loving and caring and tender so that we can provide that space so that people can heal. And I want to say to you, if you're here and you don't have a community and you don't know how to build one, I want you to know that God wants to be in that space of pain with you, that he will never leave you that he understands and that you can go to that space with him and be exactly who you are, what you are, and he will help you through it. In the absence of community, build one. Small groups are an amazing place for people to learn how to build resilience because a three, a cord is not easily broken. When, when a threefold cord, they say, is not easily broken. When we can, when we have God, us, and somebody else in community, in relationship, that's not easily broken. So I'm stronger with you than I am on my own. I'm not strong on my own. But when I'm strong in community, that's where my strength is. When I have God and when I have community, nobody is strong on their own. Because we were created for community. We were created for connection. We were not created to be on our own. We were, not, we were never created to walk this world on our own, dealing with our stuff on our own. I know we live in an individual society, and those of us who aren't from individual societies, we kind of come here, we've adopted it, but we were never created to be on our own. People heal quicker and faster in relationships than they do on their own. Community is an amazing place to build resilience because we help prop each other up. When you are weak, and I'm not weak today, I strengthen you. When you are strong and today I need you, I can lean on you. And that's the space that we create that is safe for people to build resilience. And that's what helps us get through tough times successfully and bounce back quickly. So it's not Joanna experienced her pain and she bounced back just like that. But when Joanna experienced her pain and she had somebody to talk to and lean on, go for a walk with, I can lie on your sofa and cry, you make me dinner. You listen, you direct me to support, you pray for me, you pray with me, you listen. You said, I know this person, Joanna, that I think you could speak to and I will support you while you do it. It's in that space that we regain our strength and we're able to recover quicker from chaos and crisis. It's not done only on a Sabbath. It's done on a Tuesday too. So what are you doing on Tuesday? Could you start a support group on a Tuesday? This week, somebody texted me to say, they're starting a, a group in their church for bereavement and they're going to meet virtually. Can I help them with a name? And I thought that was amazing. So what are you doing on Tuesday? Could you start a support group on Tuesday that might provide a place for the hurting to come? Because when our pain happens in relationships, it's in relationships that we're going to be healed. Our resilience is built quicker in relationships. We become resilient when we create meaning and get support to move through with help. You can, learn, you, can, you can learn to make meaning out of 
any situation that happens that will ultimately create resilience, increase resilience. The challenge is sufficient time and consistency. It needs both. It needs both. It needs to be a place where shame doesn't exist. It needs to be a community where we can come and we can excel. It needs to be a place where I know and I can understand that Jesus heals and he has borne my grief and he has carried my sorrows. I'm inviting you to lean into that verse, to be the church that creates a safe space that people can learn and lean on and how to build resilience. The community approach to resilience building is far more effective than when we do it on our own. And I want to end by saying a part of resilience building is understanding that you need support and know where to go for it. And I pray and I know that as we're working to build, that God is going to be with us. I've seen him do it too many times to believe he's going to be any different now. Lean into him because surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Amen.